Hello and welcome to Deep Impact, a proud member of the Doof Network where we dive deep into Wildbo's most second work five years on. Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. And we are back to talk about Collateral 4.8, which starts with Blake slowly inching away from a horde of animals that are advancing upon him. No, oh, I mean, I, I think we'll talk about this a bit more later, but for me, the creepiest bit is just picturing all the little mice and, and rabbits and whatever <laughs> other rodents, like just with their little teeth that, you know, they yep. could jump up and bite you with and, and they do, but we'll get to that. Yep. Yeah, it's so creepy. It is creepy. Uh, my uh, creepiest highlight is uh, Zombie Craig Doubt. Like, man, he's tragic, right? Like, he's he's so creepy and so pitiful as he's, like, mourning the the loss of these animals throughout this whole chapter and just just beyond help in a lot of ways. Yeah, like, he's just sort of rambling insanely, both in, like, violent and kind of loving ways. Like, Mm -hmm. and it's just, it's, yeah, you're right. It's just sad and terrifying. And there were multiple points in this chapter where I just was thinking, like, the right thing to do here is just put this poor guy out of his misery. Like, I feel like he's already in a bit of a fate worse than death situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He he kind of starts advancing upon Blake and is a major threat throughout this chapter, basically trying to take vengeance for he perceives Blake kind of trying to take away all the animals who are like his, I don't know, <laughs> his his friends, his only friends. Well, and, and to Blake's credit, he tries to reason with this with this guy. Mm. Um, like, you know, he doesn't just fight him, which I, I don't know, I think I might have just gone straight into, like, avid defense. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's like Blake feels this need to actually have put the effort in and to have tried. Yeah, I mean, we do kind of shit on Blake a fair amount, <laughs> especially in his interactions with Rose, but he is, his heart's in the right place, and this is another example of that. Um, yeah, I thought what was really interesting here in particular is he he connects uh, Craig's situation to his, him leaving his family, uh, which I just thought was an interesting comparison because he went through a really bad time after he left yep. Uh, yep. his family. And I think overall, he would probably say it was still the right thing to do. Like, you know, he's still dealing with a lot of it, but he did end up in a happy place. Like, it was an odyssey to get there, but mm. he did. And, and I think he would recommend it. But it's it's an interesting tack to take to basically say, hey, you know, I went through this and it's it's going to get a lot worse, but then it gets better, kind of. But then it gets worse <laughs> when you get to well, the part of the story that we're in now. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, hopefully that doesn't happen to everyone in the packed universe or it's a pretty <laughs> miserable place. Oh, you inherited all your grandmother's debt? Yeah, that happens to all of us. <laughs> um, no, you're right. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting connection that he makes. I think he... And I mean, this is, I think, part of why he's, uh, like, a, a in air quotes, a good guy is because he's gone through some shit himself, right? And so, he, you know, it, it, often people come out of that with a desire to help people not go through things that they've gone through. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to read out a quote which really highlights just the depressingness of of Craig's situation here. Uh, There was no way he'd come back from this. You won't be happy if things go back to the way they were, I said. I'll have them, he responded, his voice not even a whisper. Like, Uh, these rabid animals are his only real connection in the world, and that's just heartbreaking. Yeah, it was actually rereading this quote when you put it in here that made me sort of realize, you know, Blake was thinking a lot last chapter, like, what was this weakness that Poe's used to get into Craig? And I'm Mm. wondering now if loneliness was it, because this whole chapter, we see Craig just being obsessed with this concept of, like, you know, keeping the animals around him and belonging with the animals. Not being alone again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so it it would be very on brand for Pact, in my opinion, for that to mm. have been what Pose was taking advantage of the whole time. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So the the whole start of this chapter is tense. Uh, all the animals are like advancing on Blake, and it's like everything's circling, advancing, and kind of ready to pounce. But there have been no sudden movements yet, and so it's all building up the tension slowly and slowly, until. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's definitely that prolonged sequence where you just know where one millisecond movement 
to just the shit absolutely hitting the fan and you're just kind of holding your breath waiting for it and and then eventually it, it comes yep so the next thing that happens is the shit hits the fan um blake kind of <laughs> senses something creeping up behind him and so he kind of jumps on a table to get out of the way and this sudden movement you know breaks the dam um animals yeah. just start coming at him and he kind of goes into desperate fight mode um yeah i mean so i think he was right i think there probably was an animal right behind him that was about to pounce but it's still very on brand blake to be the first one to move and break the dam like <laughs> I, I think it's a very intentional choice by Walbo that blake was the one who did this you know he he has to be moving he's sort of always trying to preempt this sort of thing and it's just it's it's very on brand yeah yeah um yeah you're right uh, Blake fighting off these animals, the way it's described is just so unsettling to me as well. Mm. Um, it's great writing. It just kind of, you just, Blake is a character who is impulsive, yes, and we've only once before seen him become desperate, right? When he was in Conquests, when when whole Conquest stuff was happening, when he first met Conquest. Yeah. This is the second time we see this kind of desperation, and it's just so, uh, it just invades your mind. <laughs> it's It's so <laughs> overwhelmingly desperate. Yeah, I think this sort of fight scene seems like the wrong word, but yeah. I can't think of a better Struggle term. Struggle for survival, maybe, is apt. Uh, yeah, it, this got to me a lot more than, like, any other scene in this story or even either of the Parahuman stories has just because of, like, how gritty and visceral it is. Um, you know, there's no, there's no sort of fantastical element to it. Like, you know, it's not... Yeah people flying around shooting lasers yeah it's just some dude with a hatchet he can kind of use getting absolutely bitten to shit and it's like it's so full-on and intense yeah it (laughs) yeah it's really intense i i know what you mean Uh, maybe it's relatable i mean you know not that relatable i've never been in like an animal attack but i can kind of imagine that primal fear of just animals snapping and and going rabid rogue at you right i i think the grossness as well as what elevates it like this is all happening and we're getting little reminders of how like yeah. slimy and also sticky yeah. everything is and, and and blake is worried about infections constantly yeah like that's just so of course <laughs> oh yeah absolutely like I, I don't know what his plan is at the end of this chapter but he needs to go get his shots yeah yeah it's like a wave that kind of crashes into him of animals right um blake's kind of struggling to fight his way through animal after animal and he kills or injures one, and then just another one takes its place, um, until he starts getting overpowered by smaller animals, rats, mice, rabbits, all just kind of jumping at him, biting him. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, well, it's like every time he gets something off of him, doing that opens him up to being attacked by the next lot. Yeah, not even opens him up, just the time that that takes, he's already getting bitten by other things in that time. Yeah, and it's like, again, like, it's just, you know, there's there's one moment where he's got a squirrel... That's like dug its teeth into his legs oh, and God, there's a dog bit. jumping at him. And so to stop the dog, his plan is to knock the squirrel off and then hit the dog. But like knocking the squirrel off just shatters him because it like bends the teeth that are lodged in him, like as the squirrel's leaving. And it's yeah. just, yeah. Yeah. It like rips off the body of the squirrel and the teeth just kind of twist into him and he collapses as his leg gets I don't know, injected oh, with teeth. Is yeah, right like, phrase. it's just in- incredibly, like, full on. Yeah. Um, and throughout all this, Craig Doubt is is kind of half-heartedly trying to stab at him or kind of whimpering about animals getting injured. Uh, it's it's <laughs> rough. Yeah. So, fun, fun little packed fact. Uh, rabbits have claws. Learning more about rabbit anatomy this arc. <laughs> little fun, fun <laughs> interlude. Yeah, that, that, like, famous Monty Python and the Holy Grail scene actually seems a little more feasible than it ever has, now that we're learning all this insha- <laughs> insane shit about rabbits. Yeah. I also, the bit where Craig's, like, dog dies, and then he sort mm. of gets upset, and he's like, oh, you know, that that was my dog. And, and I, I think it probably, well, like, I think it's implied that that was maybe his dog before he got, possessed yeah. or what whatever used <laughs> yeah and that's just a, a little bit of sad on top of the existing sad cake that we have 
<laughs> yeah, like we needed any more sad added to this chapter. So, so Craig, after the dog gets gets injured or killed, it's it's a little unclear. I think um, Blake, uh, Craig, kind of advances on Blake and tries to stab him, and Blake kind of reacts by waving the hatchet at him, basically trying to get him to back off, but he doesn't. Um, and Blake just cuts off two of Craig's fingers, uh, and and he collapses. At least the the wound sort of. Is cauterize the right term for freezing up? Like cauterizing to me implies like melt melting it sealed, heat, whereas yeah. this is, it's almost the opposite. But he's not going to bleed out because it freeze like the wound just freezes itself solid. Those fingers are probably prime for yeah. reattachment. Or well, gro- grossness aside, <laughs> yeah, it puts the fingers right on ice <laughs> for him. Uh, so as Craig kind of collapses from this pretty solid blow, the larger animals basically get distracted and start attacking Craig instead. And Blake has the opportunity to get to the door, and he tries to open it, and it's a sliding door, and you know how sliding doors do sometimes, they, it just gets <laughs> stuck and doesn't, doesn't budge, it like slams back down to the ground again. This bit where the animals turn on Craig, like, you know, just as we're talking about more and more cream getting put on top of this, like, fucked up cake, he doesn't even seem to mind that they're eating him, like, he's almost grateful that he can help, and... <laughs> I think you're probably I reading. Just read what you wrote here. Yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah. Excited for you to read it. Out. <laughs> well, I don't think I'm going to read it out because I don't know if I could pull it off again. But as I was sort of writing this, I I realized P- Pose has inverted it, and Craig is almost acting like a loyal dog. Like we're talking about how he may have had a mm. dog, and, and so he it, it's all been inverted, and he's acting all loyal and, and and sort of you know as you'd expect a dog to do for for an owner that it loves. Uh, he's doing that for the dog yeah. and for the animals, and I just. Love that as another bit of Pooh's inversion of the natural order. It, it's the kind of kicked spaniel kind of thing, yeah. right? Like he's he's loyal to these animals even as they turn on him. I don't know this Blake going for the door and tr- and almost opening it and almost getting out. <laughs> I don't know what it is about this chapter, but it just really got to me. Like it's so this chapter's so overwhelming, and Blake has this opportunity to slip away, but the fucking door jams and just ends up drawing attention and it's like a moment of possible escape that gets cruelly snatched away by wild Bo. it's it really just got it got me i actually kind of found it almost comedic like there's this there's there's something Ugh. about how <clears throat> you're heartless <laughs> not, not the bit where he fails the escape but the way it's like all the animals are eating craig doubt and then blake uh mm you know, the door sort of crunches as it settles back into place. And there's just this moment where Blake yeah. turns around and all the animals are looking at him again. And it's just that like, mm-hmm. oh, f- fuck moment. Like you can totally see it in a screen adaptation of fact where like yeah. Blake sort of, as he's turning around, the door crunches and then the camera turns and like all the animals are just sitting up from this bloodied body looking at him and you're just like, oh yeah. shit. Yeah. It's this, if you're tracking them, the kind of tension on this chapter on a graph it's like (laughs) it's building up building up building up blake kind of fights his way through and we get pretty intense and then he gets to the door and we think oh shit we're we're out we're out it it fucks up and we turn around and things just go (laughs) from from worse to even worse than that i guess um yeah yeah the animals all just it just turns into an even more desperate fight here um he blake is kind of fighting his way through more and more animals realizing that he's not even really killing them. He's just injuring them. And they just are kind of pushing through their pain to attack him more until eventually Blake kind of, (laughs) he he becomes so exhausted, I guess that he, he gets overwhelmed and just kind of starts slowly sliding down the wall and the animals kind of back off to give him space. And you get this kind of vibe that Blake is like kind of becoming Craig in a sense. Yeah, I just thought he was giving up. Like, he's bleeding out. Like, there's just so much going wrong. This is just his breaking point. Yeah. Especially because in this really intense little fight before he hits the wall, he was literally being swarmed so much by so many animals that it started to trigger, like, his personal space issues on top of everything else. Like, as if he needed anything to get even more worse, it did. Uh, Yeah. And and that, that really leads to this sense of he's just he can't handle it anymore and like i thought that was more than fair (sighs) yeah (laughs) it's yeah it's grim um blake is basically about to give up and die and you feel it you feel it i don't know i think that's my i love this chapter and it's just because 
you just feel everything that Blake is going through this chapter. You feel overwhelmed. You feel, you know, you feel the fucking despair when the door crunches back into place. Yeah. And the, 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 the yeah, fuck. It's just like, this chapter really gets me. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I, this might be my favourite chapter in the book so far, just for intensity. Yeah. Uh, so Blake is about to give up and he notices June. June had gone out like this, hurting, hopeless, letting herself relax and accept oblivion. And at the time, Blake isn't... We're not really aware why this helps Blake snap out of it. Um, he, he kind of later puts together that June has been kind of spreading apathy around the room, and this is kind of what has led him to be so overwhelmed. Uh, but we don't really see why this l- lets Blake snap out of his... His overwhelmedness. Uh, it, either yeah. it's a reminder of, of his commitments or it's just a hint of he doesn't want to die how June did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, it could just be, you know, once he realized what was happening, he knew how to fight it. Like, there's this sense of, oh, like, it's not just me. Because I think feeling the way he felt in this situation would not have been ridiculous. Um, mm. uh, but there's this sense of, oh, June's affecting me. That means this is just like a little obstacle that I can overcome, and that's yeah. This is just a mental thing that I can beat. It's not a fault yeah. with me. It's a it's some kind of mind fuckery that I can overwhelm. Yeah, it's sort of externalizing the blame. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, you know, and then he's able to sort of you know using human intelligence, which luckily is sort of mostly unique to him in this situation. Um, yeah, so it lets him beat the animals. He's able to you know, mentally go through and dig up his list of motivations. Yeah. I, I, yeah. He, he, we're not sure exactly where he digs the energy from, but he, he pulls some energy out of somewhere and uh, he kind of picks himself back up. And, um, you know, he's realized that June's cold is also spreading her apathy. Uh, and he kind of notices that this apathy is also affecting the animals um, and realizes, hey, shit, this is my chance. Uh, and he, he does what I what I love. He he calls out to Fell by name multiple times to try and, like, summon him, which is great. Yeah, I mean, we learn that summoning Fell was, like, a dick move, mm. you know, and we'll, we'll sort of talk about that, like, a, a bit more as, as Fell brings it up. But at the time, knowing as much as Blake did, I didn't really see it as a dick move. I kind of saw it as fair to be calling to someone for help in this situation um (laughs) he did he did unnecessarily (laughs) decorate his calls to fell yeah the Um, way he does it it's just like (laughs) yeah he really puts some energy into it which i like (laughs) Uh, yeah there's definitely like i I don't know if when you're being called you hear the specific words like I, i don't I, I was not under the impression Fell gets these things. Maybe but you get a vibe. I, I, yeah, I, I was going to say. It's headcanon in my head that you get a kind of emotional vibe of what the person calling you is, is doing. Yeah, and like <laughs> Fell would have been receiving this vibe of Blake just being like, Oi, dickhead, get over here. Like, <laughs> Exactly. Oi, mate, come pick me up. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> Blake kind of thinks through his options and realizes his, his best plan is to summon June. Um, so he gives it a try doesn't work because he doesn't have the Thorburn voice as Rose put it, you know, a, a chapter, a few, a few, a few chapters ago. So Blake smashes his pot of, of fairy hair juice and uses it to change his voice to be the Thorburn voice. Mm. Using the Thorburn voice, he calls June forward and she comes. I love this as, as a use of the like literary nature of the pact verse. Like, you know, how mm. everything's so metaphorical, like, Blake doesn't need to have this concrete idea of, um, like, a, a person's voice or something. Like, he doesn't imitate Rosa's voice. He imitates this concept of the Thorburn voice, which, like, yeah, we, I don't even I, know what that sounds like. Is that is I, it I a have female to read voice? Out the line. It's, so, it's just so cool. Uh, I drew a line of liquid across my throat as if I were slitting it. There was no room for doubt or hesitation. June, I cried out. Not in my voice, not in Rosa's either. The Thorburn voice. Come. It's like, fuck, that's powerful. Like, yeah. I, I, and yeah, you're right. The fact that it's not Rose's voice either is just such a cool, weird touch that it just is so on the vibe of, of how awesome this moment is. Yeah. And like, we don't know, like, is, what does it sound like? Like, we're not told. And that's because it's like, it doesn't really matter. Like, you know, it, it's just a concept and, and, and that's what matters in the packed universe. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's so cool. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and there's a bit, like, I've got to ask myself here, like, how much of a role did the glamour play? Like, you know, presumably, like, Maggie couldn't get her hands on some glamour and then just walk around commanding the respect of the Thorburn line, right? Like, yeah. It, so, you yeah. know, it, it, I, I imagine part of it has to be, well, Blake was already close enough <laughs> sort of <laughs> I, deal. I, I, I think it definitely is that. And I think also... Blake's just kind of general ignorance about how glamour actually <laughs> works probably is very helpful to him here. Yeah, I mean, we saw we saw a lot of that in Arc 3, uh, and it, it's good to see him here just sort of continue the trend of just being like, oh, fuck it, this will probably work. And, and then yeah, I can I, imagine Rose finding out about this and being like, well, that shouldn't have worked. Why did that work? Yeah, no, I, I love that. Um, I think Blake has had opportunity to research glamour, but in my head he, he just is like maintaining his ignorance so that he can... Yeah, pull some weird, tricky shit with it. Yeah, it would seem like an asset in general. Yeah, it's like get out of jail free juice to Blake at this point. I I also just wanted to call out this line uh, as as sort of Blake is dealing with all of this going on in between. He he calls out to Fell again, and he goes and so he calls Fell, you creepy ass, gun toting bitch of conquest. I summon you, Uh, and then (laughs) a a mongrel growled at me. Fuck you too, dog. I said, <laughs> it's just, yeah. I just, and I just that found that. Presumably, also said <laughs> yeah. in a Thorburn voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a hilarious moment. Just this, uh, yeah. Just yeah, Blake taking the time. It's like while he's in the mindset of just pissing everything off while he's talking to Fell, this dog just growls at him, so he takes the time to tell it to go <laughs> fuck itself. <laughs> he's in burn the house down kind of <laughs> yeah. now. Um, so, so June kind of leads the way with Blake following, and her coldness is enough to, like, repel the animals. Well, and, and her emotional effect or whatever yeah. she has, yeah. Coldness physically, temperature-wise, and, you know, emotional yeah. coldness. Yeah, like, fair. Um, and so, uh, again, Blake is calling out to Fell to, to come and bail him out. <laughs> so, like, there's a short conversation here with June where she's she's pretty incoherent. Like, Blake has to say very specific things to trigger her. Yeah. And it was interesting because that conversation immediately reminded me more of the conversation with Leonard than the original conversation with June. So I went back mm. and read the scene where they captured June in, in 2.3. And mm. she was definitely more, she was able to form more diverse and coherent thoughts in that conversation than in this one, I would, I, I was my understanding. And, and it, I think yeah. she's still better than Leonard was in his one, but. I, mm. I'm definitely getting a sense already that she's a bit diminished. Like, I don't know how much more use we're going to get out of out of June. Like, this fight seems to have spent a not an insignificant portion of her uh, her juice. Yeah, there's a bit later where Blake kind of visibly sees June get diminished by something that he has her do. So I think we we're getting the seeds sown of June's being all used up. Yeah, and we have been told ghosts. Well, that's the main reason everyone doesn't use ghosts is is because of how fleeting they are. But yeah. also going back and reading that conversation in 2.3, there are like 10 times where Blake says something and June just doesn't respond at all. And then Rose says the same thing and she responds. And Blake Blake <laughs> kind of waves it off by blaming it on like June not wanting to talk to men. But like, I just love how going back and rereading it, it's just right there for you. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, finding out about the... The Thorburn voice, as it were, is great. I think, really, one of the best things about Pact, and we called it out almost immediately when we started diving into it, is it's just it just encourages you to reread dialogue because there's always more things going on than you think there are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like, even though we're doing such a deep dive now, I think the first thing I'm going to do when we finish in, in 12 months is probably just go and read the whole book again. But with all the context, yeah. Um, so Blake and June are heading out, and uh, there's a final boss, a big old <laughs> deer with uh, with uh, like flesh and fur hanging from its teeth. It's it's the ultimate subversion of the natural order, um, and Blake has to fight his way through it, basically. Yeah, I loved that you pointed that out. Like that didn't even occur to me. But like the deer, as you said, the deer is often like associated with innocence and stuff, and mm-hmm. and here we have this bloody like rabid deer that's sort of this final thing and i think that's really highlighted by the fact that a bit later blake also notices a bear that's just kind of chilling (laughs) like i think that's (laughs) a a, (laughs) there's a very intentional like sort of contrast so you know it's sort of highlighting how how messed up everything is because the bear the bear wasn't the threat the deer was 
Um, and this deer is intimidating as fuck. Yeah. Uh, it, it it charges Blake, and Blake kind of expends June to do a little cold blast um, to, to like, distract it, more or less. Uh, and while it's distracted, he charges it and cuts into its neck with, with the hatchet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it, this plan also kind of backfires because he says some words to June that trigger her sort of go back to sleep, uh, like, you know, action. Uh, so it, mm. it's sort of, it's using one of those powerful moves in Pokemon where then the Pokemon has to rest for a turn. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, it, I don't, you get the sense, I got the sense from this at least, and from the theme of this chapter with June to, kind of being diminished, um, that this wasn't a, oh, you've used this, need to wait for your next long rest and then you have it back. It, like, it feels like you've expended part of June. That part is now gone yeah yeah i guess well, that's Not interesting June herself but yeah you know. i very much saw her disappearing and sort of returning to the hatchet as her reliving like uh, her, her reliving her death and so that caused mm. her to well you know sort of disappear and die um mm. but it, yeah, those yeah. those two explanations are far from mutually exclusive <laughs> but yeah, it's totally. it's probably a bit of both um so Blake's fought his way through the deer. He's gotten his way outside, but June, his protection is gone. And so all the animals start to kind of approach him again. When suddenly, Fell appears. Hooray, it's Fell. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to read this this quote of Fell's arrival, where it's, uh, Fell stepped out of his car, glancing around. He drew a gun, pointing it at me. He paused. Welcome to the neighborhood, I said. <laughs> <laughs> I, like <laughs> to to save myself repeating this like a hundred times over the next like tenth of a chapter. I'm just gonna say I so enjoy Blake's constant yeah. unnecessary antagonism of it fell. Like everything he says to fell, so yeah, yeah. everything he says to fell has some sort of unnecessary dig that is just yeah. uh, hilarious. <laughs> we got this back when you know back in Jacob's Bell with Laird as well where they were just such dicks to each other all the time. <laughs> but with Laird it was like Laird is like actively trying to fuck Blake over. <laughs> with this one it's just kind of they just fuck with each other and they don't need to. Like that you know, Fell's not in a great situation either with relation to conquest. But they're just but, so antagonistic towards each other. I, yeah, I, I definitely feel like it's more on Blake's end, though. Like, Fel, Fel sort of always seems like he's just doing, I don't know, his thing. Like, you know, he he's rude to Blake, but <laughs> yeah. not, not always is in an unfair way. Where, like, you know, he just, he kind of calls Blake out on shit, basically. And Blake hates him because Fel usually picks the worst times to do it. Whereas, whereas Blake's mean, digs at Fell seem know. a lot more unnecessary to me. <laughs> to an extent, I agree with you that, that it's just escalated beyond where it needs to, but Fell did just kind of needlessly point out problems with the gift that, that Blake had gotten. And that was really the encounter that set off this, you know, mutual distaste. Yeah, but again, I, I would have said, well, Fell was just sort of doing his job there. Um, like, yeah. like to me, I, well, I think yeah. Fell, Fell's specific antagonism towards Blake has more been in response to Blake constantly being a dick to him. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so <laughs> Fel gets out of his car and basically immediately throws some sand around him <laughs> in a circle, which has become his MO, and I love it. It's like, it's such a fun little move that he always pulls out, just throwing around some sand. Yeah. Pocket sand. Sha, sha, sha. Yeah. I don't remember what the physical description of Fel was, but... Ever mm. since all this talk of what's essentially pocket sand, I'm now just picturing Dale Gribble uh, in my head, <laughs> which I, I, yeah, I can't remember at all if that's a fair description, but that's that's what I'm picturing. Um, sure. So, <laughs> so uh, Fell basically reluctantly agrees to help Blake clean up his mess. He he uh, kind of gives Doubt some 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 pocket sand, protects him. Calls the emergency responders for him and and takes Blake to deliver Poe's to to conquest, and that's the end of this kind of section. Yeah, I, I want to read out one more quote here, which is, "Stop talking," Fell told me. Unless you're talking about your diabolism, I either know already or I don't care what you have to say. This is what I do: I clean up and handle details. Like <laughs> <laughs> they're just such dicks to each other. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, Fell Fell delivers Blake to Conquest's lair, and Blake gives pose to Conquest. Um, 
But Blake asks for a favour. He knows that Conquest has Rose on a leash, and so he asks Conquest to tug that leash, and uh, Rose is pulled back, dangling from the chain, unconscious. And Conquest and Fel both refuse to tell Blake what's going on with her. Yeah, and so I love the way... So Fel has already said at this point that, like, Blake calling him or summoning him, you know, that was, like, a real dick move because it basically, like, tears at your very being. Um, like, it's not mm. like a tug at one of your connections. It's like a tug at you. And so that's why yep. people don't do this. And I wonder if that's just for practitioners or if, like, Blake's been pissing off a lot of people. Like, you know, I remember the Briar girl got pretty ticked off when he called her, and I guess now we know why. Yep. Um, yep. So so Fell's already said, you know, I, I'm going to take my revenge on you for this. And then <laughs> he refuses to answer this question about what has happened to Rose. And I love that that's enough for him to count as his revenge, which just sort of has got my hype levels maintained at the highest possible level for what this <laughs> what's happening to Rose. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, uh, one last thing uh, that I've sort of noticed is the way Fell keeps injecting himself into conversations between Blake and Conquest or other people and Conquest is giving me vibes of man pulling the strings behind the curtain. Like, I think we've talked already a bit about how Conquest is probably not strong enough to be on the top by himself and someone is probably like propping him up there and mm. what better person to secretly be pulling the strings than a guy who specializes in masking his relationships to stuff yeah the uh, very sand man himself <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah i yeah. guess i'm gonna lock that in as an official prediction i'm yep. wondering if fell lock it is in. at least part of a group that is uh keeping conquest on top um or, you know a controlling part of such a group. All right. Prediction locked in, prediction <laughs> confirmed. Uh, so <laughs> so Conquest is in a new form here. Um, he's kind of half monster, half man form. And instead of beetles, he has a green crab in his hand with three slaves tied up at his feet. And we'll dive into this green crab a little bit later. Yeah, and, and I think I think the yeah, the green the green crab is a fun detail that we'll get into, but I particularly love that there's three slaves here because i'm pretty sure last time it was two it was two yeah. yeah so i'm wondering if this is some sort of measure of conquest power or something like it, that seems like a detail that's probably going to matter um and, and at the moment i'm assuming it's probably a neat way to gauge how conquest is mm. doing interesting yeah well we'll we'll stay tuned for that i suppose um but yeah blake has uh completed the first of his trials kept his deals uh, one down, two to go, and he leaves, and that's the end of the chapter. Yeah, two to go. You know, he's he's raring, he's ready for action. Uh, you yep. know, he's not at all completely fucked. <laughs> like, I really don't know. <laughs> like, you know, this chapter just leaves with him basically being like, okay, like I guess I got to go figure out what next, and I just yeah, don't but- know how he's not going to go somewhere and collapse for at least forty eight hours. Um. It's going to be interesting. Pose was the easiest of the three challenges, right, Elliot? Well, I mean, that's what they thought. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, that bodes well. <laughs> um, so- yeah, I, I don't know what's what's worse. Either they're wrong and, you know, the others are going to be even harder, in which case, like, shit, or they're right, in which case he's still not in a state to handle what comes yeah. next. Yeah. Uh, so I know what everyone's thinking right now. What the heck was up with those crabs? Uh, so we were going to look this up. Uh, I was going to look it up at least, but when we were kind of reading through the comments, I found that uh, there was a comment by someone called Petite Sir who had uh, kind of done the job for us already researching green crabs. Uh, <laughs> so they found a species that sounds like it fits the bill. Uh, the species is Carcinus manus, which is like an invasive species on brand for a uh, for you know for conquest. Um, it's a green crab. It's it. I like this quote. <laughs> there was a quote on its Wikipedia page that I loved, so I had to pull it out. This crab's eating habits are the undersea equivalent of a scorched earth policy, <laughs> eating most of what is in its path, which is like brutal. Um, I could just imagine Wildbo like browsing the Wikipedia pages of various invasive species to see what yeah. to put on conquest next and reading that quote and thinking, well, shit, like well, decision right, made. <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously the, the two animals that conquest has had are both like invasive species, right? Um, yeah. Uh, but I, I found this other thread that I really liked where uh, Unmaker and Curious George 
were discussing like the crab and the beetle and the similarities between them, right? So they're they're both scavengers. They both eat dead things. They're both armored creatures with weaker insides. Yeah, um, I like that connection. That's really that's well, really I liked good. It too. I liked it too. But then there was a comment from Wildbo below it that just said cold. <laughs> So I guess it's not that, isn't it? I don't know what to make of that. That's that's one of those classic, well, like, ambiguous wild bow comments that le- leaves you with more <laughs> questions than answers. I interpret it as you know, oh, you're not getting warmer. You're not onto the right track. You're cold. Oh, anyway. okay. <laughs> I thought that was. I was like, oh yeah, that that does sound like a good link. Maybe that's something. And then wild bow right underneath. No. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, and so I picked out a nice little short one because I knew this was going to be a long episode because uh, this is such a great <laughs> chapter. Uh, so I, I've got a comment by George Maddox uh, who just points out that Blake really needs help right now and presumably the next thing on his list will be the hyena who's a goblin. Uh, so that mm. means hopefully it's call up Maggie time uh, and I'm just bringing mm. that to the podcast because I want more Maggie and so... <laughs> <laughs> you know, bringing it up now retroactively means that Wildbo will have made it true five years ago. That's that's how this works, uh, I think. Elliot, how many times do you have to tell you? We're in Toronto now. We're never going to see any of the Jake and Phil <laughs> characters again, okay? It's all new characters. It's a reboot. Um, no, you're right. Uh, although, you know, um, Pooze was meant to be like an imp, and he was basically more of a goblin, right? He had the, He was like defied the box that he was put in. The hyena is a goblin, in air quotes. So, I don't know. Maybe Maggie won't be as helpful as she well, I should think, be against a, like, standard goblin. I think it was at least stated that the hyena has normal goblins that work for them. So, at the very least, Maggie can stop Blake being swarmed by multiple things again, hopefully. <laughs> yep, that's true. That's true. Um, anyway, that's that's the end of our discussion on Collateral 4.8. Um, I love this chapter, Elliot. It was just such a good one. Yeah, well, it really... It, it blows the water out of you know. Last chapter was was slow, and this <laughs> last chapter was the contract negotiation. Yeah, yeah. So like the the previous yeah. chapter was slow, and I think this is Wildbo's way of just sort of saying, "Don't worry, like you know, this isn't. <laughs> I can do it all. Yeah. I can write interesting <laughs> contract negotiations, and I can fucking blow your socks off with over the top intense, uh, depressing overwhelmingness. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, that's the end of our (laughs) chapter for for today. Um, If you enjoyed the show and you want to talk about how this was your favourite chapter so far, you can do so in the discussion threads that we do for each episode where you can chat about, you know, every episode as they come out. Uh, The discussion thread for this chapter will be linked in a special place down below in the episode description. That's right. And if you want to hear more Deep Impact or any of the other great shows on the Doof Network, you can head to doofmedia.com. Yes, the Doof Media Network is a backer-supported network, which means We only can really do the things that we do because people like them and and give us some odd money every month to do them. Um, If you'd like to be one of such thanked people, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash doofmedia. Yes, and while you're stopping by Patreon, uh, you should also stop by Wildbo's Patreon, patreon.com slash wildbo, because we need him to keep writing this stuff. Mm. Yep, or else we're we're out. We're out of a job. (laughs) What are we going to do, Ellie? I'm not just out of a job, Um, I'm out of a hobby. well, you know, uh, I would be very sad. Either way, I'd be very sad if Wildbo stopped writing stories. So please do donate to him. Um, Absolutely. And if you'd like to talk to us more, you can check out our Twitter, MediaMD Podcast. And yeah, you'll, you'll just have to tweet at us if you want to hear more from us because we won't be back for a whole four days, three days. Three days. Ooh, tragic. Um, <laughs> that'll be Monday, the 25th of March, when we talk about Collateral 4.9. See you then. <laughs>